Good evening, Rockfist Church. Whoa. Was that it? Just a couple of people here? Good evening, Rockfist Church. There we go. That's better. You know, I am learning the hard way that wives are right. <laughs> Why? It's taken me so long. She goes, you need to go to the bathroom before you get up there. And I'm like, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Guess what? I got to go. So y'all hang tight. I'll, I'll be right back. I'm serious. <laughs> Thank you, honey, for trying to take care of me. For those of you who know me, I'm Julio. I'm the facility manager here. I'm also the site coordinator in Anderson Creek. I'm sure a lot of you, I know a lot of you, uh, but just for those who don't know who I am. This sermon series is a fantastic sermon series because it helps us to just think a lot. It helps us to dig into the Word of God a lot further, specifically on Wednesdays where we just dive deeper, deeper. And it's about our Christian walk every single day, every single day. And we have to realize that as we walk every single day, we have been set on a path to greatness. We've been set on a path to greatness. I strongly believe that God, regardless of what our lives look like, regardless of how we see things, regardless of how we feel things are going, God is always on our side. And God has the ultimate purpose for us, which is to lead us in a path of greatness. Now, what is this greatness? I don't want you to try to define greatness based on what the world sees as greatness. Because if you do, then you can include the cars, the house, the boat, the lake, right? The job, the money. But that's not greatness, not in God's eyes. And sometimes as we go along life, we kind of lose sight of that. We may lose sight of the fact that God has a plan for us. God has a purpose for us. God has a path for us. And that path leads to greatness. You also have to understand God has a calling on your life. Now, a lot of times we say, man, Huli, you don't, you don't know my life. You don't really know me at all. You don't understand. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've been through. There's no way that I could be, that God could use, that God will do, that God has done. That God, I, You just don't know me. But I'm here to tell you the opposite because there is a calling in your life. God has given you a purpose in your life. And so let me ask you a few questions. Do you know you have a calling in your life? Do you absolutely know you have a calling in your life? And I don't mean, yes, Julio, to volunteer. I, I volunteer at church all the time. I come here and I serve and I move here and I move there and I do things and I, you know, set up. That's not the calling that I mean. That's volunteering. and you're being helpful and we appreci I appreciate that. For those of you who want to do a little more, just get with me afterwards. I need you. But that is not what I mean when, when we're talking about in reference to the calling. Do you know you have a calling in your life? What is the bigger purpose that God is speaking to you directly? Are you striving for that calling? Are you pursuing it? Are you actually actively pursuing the calling in which you know God has set in your heart to? And if you are, fantastic. Fantastic. Keep doing it. Because some of us kind of settle, settle for the volunteer aspect of this calling. And so I'm asking you, are you striving to pursue with everything that you have and can to seek this calling? What's keeping you? So if you've answered the other ones and you're saying, maybe, maybe not so much, Julio, I feel something. I, I, God is speaking to me. He, he, he shows me things. He reveals things to me. If he is, what's keeping you? What's keeping you for, from fulfilling this? Or, better yet, what is God asking you personally? What is he asking you personally? In your devotion time, in your time with God, in the time that you spend with him, 
however that way that intimacy looks like to you, what's he asking you personally? Ephesians 2.10 says, says like this, says it like this. For we are workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has ordained, preordained that we should walk in them. For we are his workmanship, meaning that God has created you and is molding you and is prepping you for greatness. Now let's define greatness. Greatness, as I defined it earlier, is not the same greatness that God has for us. Now, great, greatness defined as I Googled it, it says, the quality of being distinguished or eminent. The quality of being distinguished or eminent. Let me, let me share with you the definition that I believe greatness in the eyes of God would be. Greatness is the fulfillment, the fulfillment of the purpose of God that he has created you and has called you to do, to be, to accomplish, to fulfill. And I don't know about you, but it, it brings me great pleasure to do something like this, to have the opportunity to do something like this, because this is my calling. I've known it since I was 16 years old. I won't tell you how old I am now, but I've known it for a very long time, and so I'm asking you, what is he calling you to do? What is he asking you to do? What is this fulfillment, this purpose, this path to greatness? And I want you to consider, because I believe that Jesus Christ's main purpose, sole purpose, was to do the will of God. And nothing else, nothing else mattered. Nothing else was even considered because it says that he came to fulfill his father's will. Hebrews 10, 7 and 9 says it like this. Verse 7 says, Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the books, in the book that is written of me, to do your will, O Lord. In verse 9 it goes on to say, Then says he, lo, and I come to do thy will. Now, the story that we're going over, which is found in Samuel 19, when you look at that story, I want you not just to see and hear the story of itself with all the characters that are involved in this, but I want you to get a bigger picture of what God is seeing over all the things that are happening in this story with all the characters that God is moving about and around in order to achieve an individual's greatness. Now, in this story, you will also see and hear when you read it, and I always do this, read it for yourself, Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 19. Now, read the whole thing, of course. It's a great story, but we're, we're talking about chapter 19. Now, in this story, <clears throat> several things happen, and so I'm going to try to quickly go over and kind of set up the stage for this story now, the prophet Samuel, the prophet of God, is in the midst of this story. For those of you who know Samuel, Samuel is, is, is an amazing character. One of the reasons I believe not only that he speaks truth and speaks the word of God, but a particular lady was so grieved and was so sorrowful that she couldn't conceive a child that she prayed to God dearly in the pit of her sorrowness. For those of you who know what that feels like, it, it's, it's a sorrow and a deepness that you can't express. As a matter of fact, sometimes the Spirit says, you can't even understand what you're feeling, that you groan with this sorrowfulness inside of you, this thing that you don't understand. So she grieved for herself because she wanted a child. And it says later on in that story that God was working and he was moving in the midst of this story. And he remembered, he remembered Hannah and gave her a son. And that son became Samuel the prophet, which is, again, how God works in the story in our lives is an incredible thing. Now, the Spirit of God was also upon another individual. His name was Saul. He was made king by people. He was made king by people. Now, the interesting part about it is that Samuel had anointed another 
another, and his name is David. Now, David was true, the true king of Israel. God had told Daniel, had revealed to Daniel, look, you're going to have to go out and search this young kid out. As a matter of fact, bring the family of Jesse. You have them come before you, and I will show you which one it is. And so his sons came in, and, ah, oh, well, no, not that. And Samuel was trying to, you know, follow God's lead and, 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 you know, utilize the revelation of God until finally he says, well, are these all your sons? Where, are you sure they're all of them? Well, there's one more that's out in the field. Let me, let me go get him. And then the minute Samuel takes a look at him, he says, that's the one. That's the one that, <clears throat> that God has called. Now, David comes into the picture. Samuel anoints him as the king of Israel, and he begins to do numerous things in the story. One of the things that he does and captures the, 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 the eyes of a lot of people is that he slays a giant. He hears this giant for 40 days calling out to, to the people, to the army of Israel, saying, who, who, who is worthy? Who's going to come out and fight me? Who's going to come out? Come on and fight. And he hears this guy defying the armies of the living God. And so he says, there's no one doing anything about it. So David moves on to the scene. And he, of course, we know the story as he slays his dragon. And so this brings a lot of fame to David. As a matter of fact, there's a song that people were singing in this story that says, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. Now, Saul was very jealous. He became very jealous of David. He was not only himself very fearful of losing his throne, he was fearful for his son losing his throne. He was so fearful that he decided to go after David because he wanted his son as his successor, not the true king of Israel. Interestingly, interestingly enough, at the same time when you read this story, it says that when the Spirit of God departed from Saul, it settled on David. And then God gave an evil spirit to Saul. And this evil spirit began to oppress him, began to make him fearful, began to lash out at David, began to bring about things like hatred and jealousy and envy and insecurity. And I'm sure it plagued him so much that he could not do anything about it. And amazingly, God brings about the same young man, the same young man to come in and soothe him as David played his harp, his instrument, it soothed him. But nevertheless, in his mind, Saul would still be oppressed by this evil spirit to hate David and want to destroy them, want to destroy him. When you read this story, you've got to see the characters in the story. We're going to go over just a few of them, but you've got to look at all the character in this story. And what I want you to do when you read the story is, again, I want you to get that picture, that God's eye picture of seeing the Lord work in every single aspect of all of these people's lives in order to make the purposes of one man, several people, to the path or in the path of greatness. Now, we'll go over just a few of them. <clears throat> Jonathan, for instance. Jonathan was the son of Saul. Jonathan spoke, believe it or not, in defense of David, even after his father was saying, man, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. As a matter of fact, I'm going to kill you when I get an opportunity. I'm going to get you. But his son, his own son, said, no, David hasn't done anything to you. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite. David has done everything for you. All the profit and the gain and things that you have have come from this person, this man. And so Jonathan defended David. Michael, not Michael like we know Michael to be. This is a different Michael. Michael. This is the daughter of the same king. And it says that the daughter of the same king loved David. She was in love with him. And she helped to defend and save his life when Saul was planning to execute him. She 
disguised, in, in her bed, she put a disguise, covered it up, put all this, I don't know, this hair on it, and just made like a dummy of, of a person so that when the messengers came, the soldiers came, uh, they would think that he was in his bed. <clears throat> Let's continue. Samuel, of course, being the prophet of God, brought a lot of revelation to David, not just revelation, but also a lot of wisdom he brought to him for him. But he also gave him a place where he could hide. It says that in 1918. He hide because David had to go on the run because Saul was trying to kill him. It would not stop from trying to kill him. Every opportunity that he had, he was planning to execute this man. Amazingly enough, the Spirit of God continues to interfere in this plan of Saul doing what he was doing because God had a purpose has a purpose, and that purpose is setting us on a path of greatness. Now, I don't want you to see this story just as King David because it doesn't only apply to him. See, God is not a respecter of men. God will do the same thing for us that he would do for David. He would have done it for Saul if Saul would have been obedient. It says in the story, when you read it for yourself, it says that Saul... If you only would do it God's way, if you only, then your lineage, your legacy would be established. But of course, when you read Samuel, 1 Samuel, you'll see that Saul chooses something else. But Micah loved, I'm sorry, the Spirit of God interrupted Saul in the times in which he was pursuing David. Three times, three times, Saul sent messengers when he found out where David was, hiding with the prophet Samuel, he sent messengers to him to destroy him, to kill him. Every single time when the messengers were getting ready to be in the presence of David, the Spirit of God changed who they were, changed how they thought, changed their heart. Now, please understand that the Spirit of God is powerful. Imagine these people have orders from their king. And those of you who are in the military, when you have orders from your king, guess what you're going to do? You're going to fulfill those order, that order. But the Spirit of God was so powerful and moved in, in, within them that they couldn't. As a, as a matter of fact, it says they prophesied instead. So the hatred and the anger and the murderous plot that they had and the loyalty they had to Saul dissolved in the presence of the Spirit three times. So much so that Saul himself said, man, I guess I got to do it myself. I guess I have to do it myself. And he went after David when he found out again where he was at. And guess what happened? The same thing. The Spirit of God came over Saul, overpowered who he was, overpowered the spirit, the evil spirit that was in him, and he also prophesied. He also spoke the word of God. Could not hurt David because the spirit of God interrupted Saul's own manhunt. You know, sometimes we think that our lives are just basic and ordinary. Sometimes we don't feel that God is perhaps preparing us for anything of this magnitude. Sometimes we feel God is maybe not positioning us for this kind of greatness, but I'm here to tell you the opposite. Yes, he is. The only thing is, is that what are we doing to see where God is working in our lives, to hear what God is saying for us to do in our lives, and then even better, to actually obey. Saul had that opportunity. Saul had the prophet Samuel talking to him. One of the wisest prophets you could ever imagine right next to him, right in front of him, speaking truth to him, speaking revelation from God, and he knew it was from God. He just chose not to do it. That's unfortunate. Sometimes we also feel that our lives are so ordinary that we may not go to places, have this greatness that God would desire of us. I hope that you understand that the Spirit of God overpowers anything that we may be, the fear we may have, the doubts that we tell ourselves, the lies, and all the emotional turmoil that goes with all of those things that plague us sometimes. The Spirit of God can overpower those things in your life. 
So much so that I want you to see, listen to this psalm. This is David's psalm. And I want you to see in this psalm, Psalms 23, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, how you can see David painting a picture, speaking this psalm about his experience when he was with Saul. Psalms 23.3 says, he restores my soul. He leads me on paths of righteousness. He leads me on the path to greatness for his name's sake. See, we understand that this walk is not for us, even though sometimes we like it to be, and sometimes we act like it is. You know, we are all humans. We do it. When you get a promotion at work, you kind of walk around a little more proud, right? When you get a big bonus, am I the only one? I mean, you walk a little taller, right? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, we all do it to a certain extent, but our walk, our path, both in righteousness and to greatness, has to glorify God. Is your path glorifying God? Or is it bringing you all the attention? Are people looking at you when you do things, whether at work, at church, at home? doesn't matter. When you do things at home, does your wife go, you're the man. And you go, yeah. (laughs) Instead of going, let that walk glorify God. I was speaking to a young man earlier today who was, He was moved by the word of God. And in his movement, he understood for the first time in a long time how far away he was from God. At least that's how he felt. And then when he looked at his family dynamic, he he also realized, I can't even glorify God within my own family because I have lost the respect of my family, of my wife. When he realized that, of course, he changed. He is desiring to change. Let's move on. Number, f- <clears throat> Number five, it says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Now, this is also very important. The reason being is because when you read that story in Samuel, when you get familiar with what's going on in all the planes of the character, you're going to realize that David was put in the midst of trouble. even in the midst of his own enemies. And see, sometimes we don't want to be put in the midst of our own enemies. Sometimes we want our enemies to be way over there. We want to ignore our enemies. We want to walk away from our enemies, especially if you have doubts and fears, if you have any kind of low self-esteem. A lot of times we just walk away and leave those things and desire for that not to happen. But God can put you in the presence of your enemy. But guess what? So that he can show you what he can do. He can absolutely show you what he can do. Then it goes on to say, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. This is the accomplishment the calling and the accomplishment of the good works that God began from the very beginning by restoring our souls. I believe this young man I spoke to, God is desiring to restore his soul. I believe that this young man is also on his way to do good works, so much so that they're going to be great works. I also believe that this path that he has chosen, God is also going to bring his enemy right before him. The same enemies that he's battled in his life, within his family dynamic, perhaps from work as well, God puts us in the midst of our enemy. And how many times do we go, oh, what am I going to do? God, help me. I am surrounded by my enemies. Guess what? Sometimes that's exactly where God wants you to be. But our flesh doesn't want us to be there. With God, all things are possible. And God, just because you're in the midst of your enemy, doesn't mean you're defeated. Doesn't mean he can't do anything. Let's move on. I'm going to ask you a few questions. Do you believe, will you believe that God is ordering every single step 
of your life. Will you believe and do you believe that God is ordering every single step of your life, both in the preparation, in the positioning, and in the purpose of your calling? Do you believe that? Will you believe that? Do you believe that your ordinary life, as you may see it now, do you believe that's on a path to greatness? I know sometimes we tell ourselves, nah, yeah, no. <laughs> you, you don't know. Well, guess what? God knows. God knows. And let me tell you, even through the ordinary, God will show up and do the extraordinary in your life. And I know there's many people here that have witnessed and experienced God movement in your life. Extraordinary things can happen. Good and bad things happening, but God is placing us on a path to greatness. In the story that you've read, through all the characters that we just talked about, Jonathan, Jonathan, giving up everything that he thought was a person that would rather do what was right and suffer for it than to do what is wrong and gain something from it. Who do you identify in this picture? In this story, do you identify with Micah? Do you identify with the prophet Samuel? Because some of you have been called to prophesy. Some of you have been called to speak the word of God into someone's life. Who do you associate most with? Who do you identify most with? Now, let me tell you, you know what? I totally forgot. Every time I hit this thing, it changes everything over here. Oops. So you guys have been going. <laughs> <laughs> Do you identify with Saul? Do you have that spirit of selfishness that it's all about you? Everything you do has got to be for you. If there's no gain in it for me, guess what? I'm not doing it. And if I do, just say thank you and okay, you're good. I look good in your eyes. Perfect. I'm good. Do you identify with Jonathan? As I said earlier, this man would give up his kingdom for the anointed one of God and suffer even to his demise from his dad, who was, first of all, I think he was crazy. You have an evil spirit in you. He's going to torment you to the point that you're going to be crazy. He could have been killed by his own dad in this state with this influence in his life. Micah. The spirit of love and sacrifice. She loved him so much, she would sacrifice her relationship with her own dad. I mean, those of you who are parents, imagine your daughter going against you, your household, to the degree that my enemy, you're in allegiance with my enemy. What's wrong with you, girl? What's the matter with you? Do you not love me? Do you not love us? And Samuel, of course, like I said before, is speaking the word of God, speaking the word of truth into somebody's life. You don't have to be a prophet to speak truth in somebody's life. You just have to speak truth to them. And it's got to be based on the word of God. Or do you associate most with David? David, who, as we know, is after God's own heart. But not just his heart, but it says in, in the chapters, it says his own mind and his own ways. I mean, we, we, we learn it as David's after God's own heart, but it doesn't say just his own heart. It says those two things, his ways and his mind as well. And so much so that he became obedient like Jesus in every fashion of his life as best as he possibly could and he was set on this path to greatness. Look, look, when you read the story, look for yourself what happens. God establishes his throne. God establishes the nation of Israel. It's an amazing thing what sometimes we think in our own little world that God can't do. But yet he uses story after story after story to get us to understand that God can do anything. Anything to those who are obedient to him. Anything, anything to those who are following his spirit. Anything to those who love and sacrifice their own lives. Anything to those who love righteousness at all times, not just when it benefits you. Anything to those who put their flesh aside 
put themselves aside, put their lives aside for what he has for us. And that is a path to greatness. Now here's the big question. I don't know where you are. I don't know what your life looks like. I don't know what you think of your own life, your own path, your own walk. But will you do this? Are you willing to trust God and begin to give up those things? Remember we talked about earlier and, and last Sunday sermon series, we left with that question, what are you willing or what do you need to give up to live the life God has called you to? What are you willing? And after you say yes to I'm willing, there comes a little more. Now you got to trust God with it. You've got to trust God with it. Y'all know the old saying, we play yo-yo with God. You know what I mean? Lord, please take care of this. If you, an hour later, nope, yo-yo's back. Lord, take care of this. A week later, things don't happen the way you think. You take it back. So you're playing this little yo-yo game with God. Trusting in God helps for you to release that once and for all. And what's keeping you from this greatness that God has you set on? Because we got to let it go. Man, you got to let it go. You got to let it go. Sometimes we want to hang on to it because we think it's part of our identity or part of our personality or part, that's just me, Julio. That's part of my character. Well, if it's standing in the way of your greatness and your walk with God, let it go. Let it go. You'd be surprised how often when you begin to trust God and, and give these things up, how the Spirit of God will empower you to continue forward with it. And then most of all, he brings a whole bunch of like-minded people around you to encourage you and keep you uplifted in prayer. Now, if you need prayer, just come up here and we have people that will pray for you. If you're going through this thing that you are not quite wanting to give up and you need prayer to finally release that thing and just, just let it go. You got to let it go. You can't hold on to these fears or these doubts or these habits. You got to let it go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, we thank you so much that you speak to our hearts, Father. And you know every single person in this room, Lord, as you know their heart and you know their minds and you know their ways, Father. There is something that weighs deep within them, that flows deep within them, Lord, that you know they, we need to let it go. And Lord, as we contemplate these things this evening, through today, through tonight, through, through the week, as we consider these and know that uh, I know you're calling me to let this go. I know personally I hear you. You convict me. You bring it about every single time and you show me I've got to do something about this, Lord. Thank you that you reveal those things to us, first of all. And second of all, Lord, thank you that you give us the opportunity to make these amends in our lives, whether it be in relational or individual, Lord. Thank you that you give us the time necessary, Lord, to get this right. And as we pursue after you, we ask that you bring those righteous people in our lives, those fellow Christian believers, Lord, those people that will not let go of righteousness, will not do anything opposed to your righteousness, Lord, and let them help us, lift us, and bring us into a place where we can say, you know what? God has me on a path to greatness. He has me on a path to greatness. And this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, guys.